Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and it is, the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up whatever was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately he made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up, to, up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Who's going to pray for the preacher today? Anybody going to pray for the preacher today? Kaylee's not here this morning. We cannot rely on the 10-year-old to pull us out of the fire here. Anybody want to pray for the preacher today? I guess the preacher will go prayerless today. You know why I do this, don't you? So you all get used to praying in front of people, praying spontaneously, praying extemporaneously without worrying what it sounds like or how wonderful it is or how articulate you might be. It's about praying for the person who's going to bring you the message this morning. Anybody going to do it? Kathy Fader's going to do it. Good for Kathy Fader. Thank you, lady. Heavenly Father, thank you for getting us all here today to this happy place where we feel closer to you, though you are everywhere in our lives. The happy face of Pastor Terry is something we all look forward to. She's a ray of sunshine today with the flowers on the altar and the beauty that dwells herein. We all need your prayers, Pastor Terry, a few more these days than in previous days or for others. Please guide her as you always have in your ways and continue to allow her to preach your love, your joy, your giving beyond all understanding that we have. Bring us together as a congregation. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you a list of words, and you're going to give me a thumbs up or thumbs down if it's a negative or a positive or a good word, bad word, otherwise. Service. Good. You can yell it out too. Good? Servant. We got some. Ah. Depends on who's the servant, right? Who's being served? Charity. Good. Some of you are saying good. I hope you can say good when you're not. Oh, I got two thumbs up from Jeremiah out there. It's a good thing. Okay, here's your, here's your quiz of the week. 
Did anybody look at the um, daily practices this week? Where was the root of the word charity? What word does it begin with, really? Caritas, it means love, the agape love that we're supposed to embody for one another, the love of Jesus Christ poured into us. But I don't think everybody thinks charity is a good word because I went down a rabbit hole this week called, what's it called? My neighborhood? What's, I always forget what it's called. Rob, what was it called? Next door. Next door, Warren Road. I went down this rabbit hole and I thought, I'm going to have to read you some of these uh, great... Now, I, before I read them, trust me, before I read them out loud, I made sure none of you wrote them. But this is what our neighbors say. Does anyone know why the homeless encampment on Radcliffe Road is allowed to remain? I've never seen anything like this in Towson. It appears that a young man lives among a bunch of trash, furniture, bags of clothes, etc., just sitting there on Radcliffe Road behind CVS. To which someone replies, have you been to D.C.? Then we have, or Florida, they're everywhere there. Not to wax philosophical, you can give the homeless money, but you can't get them to work a tedious job for minimum wage. Homeless encampments are a health and safety hazard, not to mention an eyesore, allowing random people creating little trash dump encampments and coddling them with food handouts is not a sustainable solution. They need to be moved somewhere where they can get structure are unable to establish for themselves. Mental health is always a consideration. Unfortunately, public policy regarding sheltering the homeless doesn't seem to hold any criteria regarding making sure they're institutionalized so they can demonstrate the ability for self-care. Call the police. If that doesn't do it, start bugging your politicians. And what else do we have here? Um, he has been offered help by many. However, his severe mental illness does not allow him to comprehend the help he's being offered. It's an endless cycle of trying to help with no end in sight. Until he gets some medication, he'll be living on the sidewalk there. What a horrible thing not to have a roof over your head at night. Nowhere to escape from the weather. Nowhere to go to the bathroom, shower, or prepare. No one, no matter how their life choices, should have to live that way. Being homeless and irresponsible is a life choice for some. Abusing substances, losing everything and everyone is also a life choice. And then the last one, this is a nasty comment, so please, if you don't like it, move on. I think all the homeless and poverty-stricken should cross the border and re-enter as illegal. They'll get respect and a nice place to live. Think everybody thinks charity is a good word? I don't think so. Because you're giving handouts to people who don't seem to care, right? Let's be honest. Don't you ever think that when you see somebody begging, you know, get a job? I've had people say that to folks on the road before, get a job. Or you chose to be homeless, or you choose to be an alcoholic, or you choose to be addicted to drugs, or you've chosen this lifestyle for yourself, and I have worked hard for what I have. I'm not going to help you. But that's not what we're hearing in Scripture, is it? Now, I said service, but really the, the spiritual practice is called almsgiving. It doesn't make along with an S, and we've got all these S's going, so we just called it service this week. Service or servanthood involves the poor. I read to you again a little bit of what we read in Deuteronomy, what Katie read to you. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Who is that saying that? I therefore command you? That would be God, folks, in case you're wondering. I therefore command you. I don't suggest to you. I don't say, wouldn't it be nice if you all fed the poor? Wouldn't that be great if you gave to people in need? Nope, it is. I command you. And when is God commanding this? If there's any among you in need, any member of your community, in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. They're getting ready to move into the land. They're moving out of slavery. They know what it is to be enslaved. They know what it is to be someone's forced servant. Now they're told they have to care for each other. It's hard. They don't know how to be anymore. And God is saying to them, this is how you're going to be. You want to be in me. And it says, now be careful that you're willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Be, be careful you don't entertain a mean thought thinking the seventh year, the year of remission is near. Therefore, view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. 
Every seventh year was the year where there was a forgiveness of debts, land lied fallow, so they could, it could heal itself. It's sort of the Sabbath of Sabbaths. And then every seventh, seventh year was the year of Jubilee when everything was forgiven. If you had a slave, you had to free your slave on the seventh year. If you had, um, if you had a debt or a mortgage, they would just be forgiven you. So people would say, oh, if I'm going to lend, I don't lend anybody in the sixth year. I'd like to lend it to them in the first year. So I lend it to them in the sixth year. I'm never going to get repaid. I'm going to have to eat what I lose. And God is saying, don't do that to people. Give freely as you have need. Now that's Deuteronomy. We might think, well, that's the Old Testament. I don't have to listen to that anymore. But it gets worse in the New Testament, doesn't it? James, the epistle of James. Now, this is a controversial epistle. Martin Luther himself, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, the, the former, thought this should be stricken from Scripture because he said, this is works righteousness. This is an epistle of straw, he says, because it says faith without works is dead. I don't know about that. I don't think it's works righteousness, but I don't think you can, like James says, if you say to somebody who lacks daily food and you say, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, bye-bye, have a good life, but you're not going to do anything to meet their needs, that's not faith. That's hollow words. And he says that kind of faith is dead. Now, then we get to Matthew. And these are the words of Jesus Christ, which is even a little more scary than that, because Jesus himself is saying what God has been saying from the beginning, to help people. He doesn't tell them to help. Well, he sort of does, but he shows them by example, doesn't he? He says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. We're going to read this next week when we look at silence and solitude. We're going to read it from another perspective. But when he heard this, when he heard the death of his cousin John the Baptist, he went off to pray by himself, but the need was so great the crowd followed him. I've said before, this miracle of the feeding of the multitudes is the only one that appears in all four Gospels, and it appears six times in four Gospels, which means God wants us to pay particular attention to this one. This is indisputably something that happened because the witnesses were so many, thousands of people. But we understand the disciples, don't we? When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place. The hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Two problems with that. What will one be? You have to answer back this time. Jesus says, they got to eat. The disciples said, send them away so they can go buy something in a neighboring village. How many over there were there? 5,000 men plus their wives and kids. So we're looking at 10, probably 12, 15,000 people. What's the problem with go send them to the next town to buy something to eat? There wouldn't be that much food. They did not have an all-night Walmart on the side of the hill in the first century. And even if they had a little baker, he looks up and sees 12,000 people coming toward him. He's not thinking he's going to get rich. He's thinking, how do I feed all these people? So that was one problem. What's the other problem with this crowd? Go buy food for yourselves. No money. Absolutely which is true, they followed him because they heard this man, this man could heal people. He could heal them just by touching them. They were, they were made well, and he had done all these things they'd heard about, and they wanted desperately to believe it. They wanted to see for themselves, and they follow him. He's exhausted, but still he's worried for them because they're hungry, and he says, you feed them to the disciples. And the disciples said, but Lord, we've only got enough for ourselves, barely enough for themselves. We said before, the fish that came out of the Sea of Galilee were mostly sardines, little fish. And the bread that they baked was not like a big old loaf of Wonder Bread, was it? It was a little round cake of bread. Barely enough for them to have a bite. And Jesus says, you feed them. I think this is the same message that we get in Deuteronomy, the same exact message, because Jesus is saying to us what God has said. If you understand where everything you have comes from, you'll understand it doesn't belong to you. I don't think it was until I bought my first home in West Virginia that I realized that you don't really buy anything, do you? You sort of pass through it. You rent it. Because one day, some, now, right now, somebody else is living in the home that I bought with my husband in West Virginia. There's going to be a day when someone else lives in my house in Reisterstown because I'm not going to be here forever. 
But if we forget where these things come from, they come from God. It's God who blesses us. God, when God was leading them across the Jordan into the land God had promised them, God said, I'm taking you from slavery into freedom. But your freedom is going to require that you remember who it came from. And every time the Jews forget, every time we forget today where our blessings come from, things don't turn out so well, do they? And so God is saying to the people, who are always going to be here on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. I asked Jackie to do the lesson this morning for the kids when we were talking, and it came to me as I was reaching into this lovely jar of Hershey's Kisses that Arlise gave me that are on my desk. If you reach in and you try to grab hold of something and you don't like, if you're trying to get too many at one time, what happens when you try to get your hand out of the jar? You get to walk around with a jar on your hand, right? Basic physics. Sometimes you have to let go to be able to even get something for yourself, much less to give to the rest of the world. We're called to share, and if we share what we have, if we understand that everything we have is a gift from God, the food that we eat, the places we live, the clothes on our backs, if we understand that that is the relationship we have with God that provides all our needs, we will be more likely to share what we have with others. So almsgiving. I want you this week to think about your almsgiving. I want you to look at your credit card receipts. I want you to look at your bank statements. I want you to look at how you spend your money. Where is it? Is it all going to you or your kids or your indulgences or is it going to others? I remembered yesterday I was in the grocery store and I remembered I needed candy for the Easter eggs. One of these days I'm actually going to pick up the food that I set aside for the Kakisul Food Pantry and bring it. That's my ADD. It's not my heart. It's my ADD. I always I have it there with my keys on and I'll pick up my keys and walk right out the door and think, where's the food? But I should remember that because I eat every day. I should remember that other people do not eat. The Thrifty Penny is one of the best mission arms of this congregation. Not because we make money for mission, but because they help people who are in need. If someone is there who cannot afford clothing, they get clothing. I love the story of the man who came in and bought men's clothes of every size. Didn't matter what shape they were in, he bought them. And someone finally said to him, you must have a big family of multiple sized people. And he said he gives them away in Baltimore City. He goes where there are poor people on the side of the road who don't have enough clothing on. And he gives them away. And you know what happened then? The Thrifty Penny said, well, from now on, we're going to give them to you. Because that's what we're here to do. We're here to meet the needs of folks. So I want you to think about what you're going to do this year to serve God by giving alms. What are the alms that you're going to give? And there's nobody more generous than a little kid. I tell you that right now. Little children will give you the last nickel in their pocket if they think you need it. They will. It's when we get older that we start thinking, well, if I give that nickel, I may not have one for myself. But I want you to think about what you're giving. I want you to give more. I want you to go deeper. Because it's not the tithing that is the Lenten practice. It is the almsgiving that is the Lenten practice. Tithing is what we do every day of our lives. We give the first 10% of what we have to God. Always, everywhere, everything. That's the biblical minimum standard. Unfortunately, sometimes that's all I give in a year. Last year, I didn't even tithe because of the situation I had at home. But I'm making it up. I'm going to make it up this year. I will give probably 15% to the church this year because of last year's misfortunes in my family. You can still give even if it's a little later in the game. It's all right to do that. But we need to look at our almsgiving, how we're giving to the poor, what we're doing to care for the poor. Maybe it is just bringing an item for the Cahiesville Food Pantry. Maybe it's going on the Baltimore County Christian Work Camp, which is coming up. Their 40th year of helping people in this community you cannot imagine what it's like not to be able to get in and out of your home without a ramp. I took Jackie by to see the ramp that we built a few years ago on Poplar Road. Maybe you'll go on that trip. Maybe you'll go with us if we get to go to Kentucky. We're looking at going to Redbird Mission, which is a missionary conference of the United Methodist Church. Kentucky still has one of the lowest or highest poverty rates, let's call it that, lowest income level, highest poverty rates in the nation. We may go there and work for a week. I called them up and I said to them, if I were to come along, me with my bad shoulder, my bad knee, my bad 
everything that falls apart on me. I said, what could I do? She said, you could work in the store. No hesitation, like, oh no, here comes somebody that we have to accommodate. It was like, well, if you can't work on a work site, you can work in the store. We have jobs for everybody, every age level, every, that's the only place that we found that would take kids under 14 years old. They can go to Kentucky and work on the work camp. But if you can't go and you can afford to, we need checks for $425 to send the people who are going. Some of you can afford that. Some of you can't afford it, but you do without some luxuries to be able to pay that for somebody to go. Or you can work in the Thrifty Penny. Linda, do you still have some shifts available for people to work? Next Saturday, you can come buy some jewelry or you can give some jewelry to sell. There are so many ways to help in the world, but we've got to get over thinking that it's all about us and about what we have and what we need to hold on to. Because God didn't say it would be nice if you'd share. God said, I command you to care for the poor. I command you to care for the poor. Just as James said, faith without works is dead. Now, when I had my knee replaced, I was in the hospital in Winchester, Virginia. Within two hours, you're up and walking and you're in physical therapy. Physical therapist said, now remember, you step down on your bad leg and up on your good leg. It's just like when you die and you go to heaven or hell. I said, no, it's not. Because even, even my stupor of anesthesia, I said, no, that's not a good analogy because it's not what you do in this world. It's not about works righteousness. That's one thing James is not saying. He's not saying if you're bad, you go to hell. If you don't do this, you go to hell. If you're good, you go to heaven. I said it's about the grace of God in Jesus Christ, but it's the grace of God in Jesus Christ that makes him look at that crowd and say, we can feed them, we can feed them, we just have to do it. So I'm going to say what God says to you this morning. Go out and feed somebody who's hungry. Go out and help someone who is downcast. Go out and put your arms around someone and embrace someone who is hurting inside, and you will know what it is to be like Christ in what you do. Now, for John... His gospel account of the feeding of the multitude is really what is Holy Communion for us. Because in that one, Jesus feeds all 10,000 people by himself, and he gives thanks to God, and he takes the bread, and he raises it up, and he says, thank you, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he shares it. Because the night of John's last supper, we don't hear about communion there. What do we hear about? What does Jesus do with them? He washes their feet and says, as I serve you, so you must serve others. So servanthood and almsgiving is a great way to get closer to God during Lent. So I'm going to pray that you will all examine your hearts and figure out what it is that you need to do. And then in the name of Jesus Christ, do it. To the glory of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, amen, amen.